Honorable Chairpersons of the session is Professor Dr. Shafi Mojumdar sir, Professor Abu Ajam sir, Professor Dr. Khalid Mohsin sir, Professor Khalid Kujaman sir, and uh, uh, moderator is Dr. Tahamina Rahman, uh, panelist is Colonel Dr. Mohammad Waliu Rahman, Dr. Robindranath Bormon, Dr. Mohammad Shahriyar Kobe, Dr. Humayun Kobe Mintu. Uh, I am okay. requesting uh, the chairpersons, moderators and okay. panelists okay. to take their chairs in the stage. Assalamu alaikum and welcome you all to our last session that is interesting case presentation. The chairpersons of these sessions are Professor A.K.M. Shafi Mojumdar, Professor Khalikud Jaman, Professor M.D. Khalid Mohsin, Dr. A.K.M. Monwarul Islam. Due to time constraint, we have to uh, go for, uh, forward quickly. So we are going to start the session. The first presenter of this session is Assistant Professor Dr. Bijoy Dotto, who will present his case on mandatory versus complexities. Respected chairperson, panelist, my dear fellow colleagues, students, a very good afternoon. I am Dr. Bijoy Dotto, Assistant Professor of Cardiology. My, Today is my topic on mandatory versus complexities. I am acting as an esteemed professor of cardiology from the long time from in NICBD. Uh, I want to share one or two cases with all of you. Mr. X, 61 years, diabetic, smoker, with effort angina, CCS class 4, on guideline directed medical therapy on maximum management, maximum medical management. His ECG shows ST depression in B1 to B6 and echo shows anterior oral hypokinesia to his extreme direction 46 percent. As the maximum management falls, we plan for his coronary angiogram, it shows that 90 percent stenosis in medial AD around the origin of the D1 and this is made in a 110 class bifurcating lesion. Bifurcating lesion. So we uh, plan for uh, the, his right system is normal. So we plan for uh, PCI and pre is done with 20 to 13 millimeter of semi-compliant belly at 12 atmospheric pressure, keeping a wire in the D1 and a long stand of 2.75 into 48 uh, millimeter giant expedition was deployed. And after stand deployment, we see that there is stand under expansion. And we try to dilate it with non uh, NC balloon, 3 into 15 NC balloon. Then still you see that there is under expansion. So we dilate it with 3.5 into 16 millimeter balloon at 14 atmospheric pressure. And while we are serially presenting but patient uh, uh, dilating and that patient develops suddenly shortness of breath and chest pain. And look, there is great free perforation. And, and we try to prolong balloon inflation for 10 minutes. But it failed to seal. And again, Prolong balloon inflation for 20 minutes. Fails. And then we tried with the same balloon for the 30 minutes. And it also fails. Still there is leaking. And finally we could manage a Covered stent that is graft master 3.5 into 22 uh, millimeter. We deployed it at 12 atmospheric pressure, and after deployment, that this is the final view, and we finally seal the perforation. In my second case, it was a 52 years male smoker, diabetic, hypertensive, dyslipidemic patient, chronic stable angina, CCS class three. And his ECG shows T inversion is 2, 3 and ABF and ETT is positive in stage 1. His ejection fraction is 55 percent and echo shows inferior wall hypokinesia. Angiogram shows 
80 to 90 percent stenosis proximal to meet RCA. Pre dilatation down was 2.5 into 12 millimeter maverick balloon at 10 atmospheric pressure. Then we deployed resolute onyx stent, but after deployment, it shows that there is still some under expansion of the stent. So we tried to post dilate the lesion with NC balloon 4 into 15 millimeter at 12 atmospheric pressure. Uh, when we are post adding the uh, lesion, then again CBR chest pain develop and and it shows like that. That is grade three or in some cases grade four perforation. Then we are in a hurry. We tried for uh, prolonged balloon infection, but nothing happened. Nothing was in uh, my favor. Everything goes in vain. Uh, as the patient is going down and is, it is in going shock and uh, respiratory rate is more, pulse and BP was going unrecordable. So we, uh, we call for the covered stand, but at that time we could not manage the covered stand. So in our hand, we, we, uh, we have a plan that we will try to uh, deploy a long stand that is the previous stand was 3.5 into 30, and so we, uh, we deployed another stand that was 4 into 40 millimeter, 40 millimeter size, and we tried to deploy it, and we tried with this stand balloon, pro with prolonged stand balloon in inflation at low atmospheric pressure at 8 m, 8 atmospheric pressure, and finally we uh, see that the Leaking are gradually down or reducing and still some leaking. So we uh, again tried with a prolonged balloon infection that is 4 into 15 millimeter that was in our hand previously. And finally, this is sealed off. So incidence of coronary perfusion is uh, though rare, it is only 0.2 to 0.6 percent of all PCI, but it may happen anytime, in an, even in an expired hands. So the balloon, oversizing of the balloon or stand, guidewire damage, or CTO PCI, uh, there is highest risk in, in CTO PCI, there is 4.8 to 8.8 percent risk, and use of atherectomy or laser ablation. The incidence may increase in the future as the increasing complexity of attempted coronary lesions, complex coronary lesions such as CTO. Clinical sequelae following coronary artery perforation may be there may be death, myocardial infarction, or cardiac tamponade. So immediate and sustained sealing of the perforation to prevent hemodynamic collapse with covered stents represent the most common method to treat the site of hemorrhage when initial conservative management like prolonged balloon inflation fails. In, according to the Ellis classification, there is type 1, type 2, type 3. In my case, the first case was type 2, and in second case, this was type 3 for perforation. And successfully, we managed both the uh, patients. And this is the algorithm for management of coronary perforation, class 1, class 2, class 3 perforation, and we managed it accordingly. So the take home message is post dilatation is mandatory in most of the PCIs. It may cause coronary perforation even in expired hand. So for the young colleagues, don't be panic if there is any perforation. Keep your brain cool and try to handle with patience. Assess the situation first. Don't inject repeatedly. Never lose your wire and guiding catheter. Make a sequence of your action plan. Ensure all the hardware with covered stent, if possible. Call for cardiac OT. In this case, we already called for cardiac OTs, but ultimately it was not needed, finally. So low pressure, balloon inflation, pericardiosynthesis, covered stent, and coil embolization may be life-saving. Thank you. Thank you for patient here. Thank you, Dr. Bijay Dotto. Due to time constraint, the question-answer session will be open after the uh, completion of this whole session, whole presentation. Now may I request the young, brilliant, enthusiastic associate professor, Dr. Jafrin Jahan, madam, 
to present her case on left-main bifurcation and how she unfolded it. Respected chairpersons, discussants and dear audience, assalamu alaikum and very good evening. I am Dr. Jafrin Jahan from NICVD is going to present my case. This is LM bifurcation, how to unfold. A 36 years old male hypertensive on AC inhibitor and smoker came with chronic coronary syndrome class 4 on beta blocker, nitrate, ranolazine and nicorandil. History of non ST elevation MI 6 months back and PCI2 LED 5 months back. His echo is mild anterior wall hypokinesia with LV ejection fraction 50% and ECG anterior wall inversion and T wave inversion. <coughs> the initial CG of left system showing there is lesion in bifurcation of the left main and osteal LED, proximal LED, and LCX, and that is. <coughs> ISR in the proximal LED. And the previous PCI showing stenting from distal LED to distal LM to LED. We have done relook CG and it's showing bifurcation lesion and ISR. And the CG of RAS system is normal. The syntax score is 28 and the euro score is 2. Now, should we treat all left main disease? If yes, why? And when? According to 2014 ESC, ESCTS guidelines on myocardial revascularization, left main disease with a syntax score less than or equal to 22 is type 1 for CABG and class 1 for PCI. Left main disease with syntax score 23 to 32 is class 1B for CABG and class 2A for PCI. And left main disease with syntax score more than 32 is 1B for CABG and class 3 for PCI. So what to do? CABG, PCI and heart, heart team approach. We can see the angle is less than 90, percent, 90. And what should be the elective PCA strategy? Medina 111, side branch is significant, supply more than 10% myocardium, side branch diameter more than or equal to 2.5 millimeter, angle is less than 90, side branch significant stenosis, and IVA study should be done. So we thought for upfront double strand strategy, provisional stenting or single strand strategy. What to do? Uh, we plan for uh, double strand strategy. We put a wire from left main to LED and L6 and predilated the LED and both L6. The I was showing the MLA is 4.6 for left main, 3.73 for LED and 2.63 for L6. We have already done predilation of L6 and LED. And stenting, we first do, did stenting of left main to LED. Then we, we have done very crossing and stenting of L6. And finally, the pause and pot and KBI. And this is the final result. And the repeat I was showing the improved MLA of left main and proximal LED, 9.25 and 7.32. The final result is satisfactory, I think. Then why we do the pot for stent apposition, recrossing after deployment, proximal optimization, and after proximal optimization, where recrossing is easy. And pot technique to facilitate side branch access. Thank you all for patient hearing. Thank you, madam, for your br brilliant case. Now, I request Dr. Dev Dulal Devnath to present his case as B bite might be a big bite. Good afternoon, 
honorable chair respected teachers and my dear colleagues uh, welcome to this session i am dr jabdul jamnat medical officer of nicbd unit 18 under the professor of uh, nur alam sir uh, this is a great pleasure for me uh, to, i get a chance to present this case in uh, this such a big Right, and I am grateful to Associate Professor Nuralam Sir for giving me the opportunity. And uh, to this, uh, my case is B bite, might be a big bite. Uh, my patient, 50 years old, a businessman, smoker, was stung by B <coughs> while watching collection of, of honey from honeycomb three days back. He developed central chest pain, sweating, rash, along with generalized body ache. With this complaint, he attended a local physician and treated with hydrocortisone and antihistamine. On that time, an incision was done, which showed abnormality, and referred to a tertiary care hospital. There, he was diagnosed with a case of myocardial infarction and treated conservatively, and referred to NICBD for further management. And he had no significant past history of allergy and chest pain. On examination, there was a calmness present over face, arm, and neck, and conservative is congested. His vitals are normal, and the other system examination reveals no abnormality. Uh, this is the graphic. Uh, this is the picture of this patient who is just taken with permission. There is conservative and congested. There is a kind of is present over face, um, face, neck, arm. Uh, this is the initial ECG of the patient uh, is missing due to he lost his ECG. So ECG is taken one day after uh, the admission of patient, and this show heart rate 80 beat per minute regular. There is ST elevation in 23 ABF and QF in. 23 ABF and there is also ST depression in one in ABL and this is the another ECG of this patient who is was taken two days after his admission. This shows a heart rate 90 beat per minute re regular. There is QF in 23 ABF and T inversion in 23 ABF B4 to B6. And baseline is distribution normal except rest to put in I. This is the echocardiogram which show hypogonesia of the distal inferior wall in apical two chamber view. And patient is treated in hospital with antiplatelet, statin, nitrate, antihistamine, and after that we plan for coronary angiogram. Coronary angiogram done through right radial, uh, radial access, and this uh, this is the RO coral view showing significant lesion in left circumflex artery, which is about 60 to 70 percent proximal to OM1 and OM2, and uh, this is the this is the RO. <coughs> Epicranial view showing uh, 30 to 40 percent lesion in left anterior descending artery. This is the spider view which shows the significant lesion in left circumflex artery proximal to OM1 and OM2. And this is the aerocranial view which is showing 30 to 40 percent stenosis in the mid LED. And now the left right system. And this is the RO view showing uh, 70 to 80 percent lesion in the distal RCA with normal PDA and PLV. And this is the uh, AP view showing same lesion in the RCA, and the LA cranial view show, uh, showing the same lesion in the RCA. This is the angiographic finding. So uh, history of stung bite followed by myocardial infarction and angiographic finding. My diagnosis is Kaunis syndrome type two. So I want to give some information about the Kaunis syndrome. In Kaunis syndrome, it is the occurrence of acute coronary syndrome in the setting of allergic or anaphylactic reaction. And it is first reported in 1950 in a 49-year-old uh, man. Kaunis and Jabras first described the pathophysiology of Kaunis syndrome. And it is not a rare disease. And uh, so incidence 7.9 to 9.6 per 1 lakh inhibitants in a year in a case report of... And this is the pathophysiology, uh, mass cell activation and degradation in the center of pathophysiology of the Kaunis syndrome. There are several triggers for Kaunis syndrome, such as uh, drugs, which is the main trigger. It includes anti, uh, antibiotic, uh, antineoplastic, analgesic, which include NSID and uh, morphine. And there are some environmental exposure, such as bee, uh, insect bite, bee sting, and there also have some food. After uh, triggering factor, there is also release of, um, uh, there is activation and degradation of mast cell and there is release of mediators, such as system related activating factor, arachidic acid metabolite, cytosine, and tryptase. This causes local and systemic effect. 
systemic effect is anaphylaxis and local effect into myocardium and coronary artery, which include uh, vessel constriction, vessel spasm, uh, uh, plaque rupture, plaque erosion, activation of coagulation cascade, and followed by thrombus formation. And there are three types of coronary syndrome. Type 1 is allergic coronary vessel constriction, which occurs in a normal coronary artery. In a patient, with, a patient may have pre, uh, previously uh, microvascular disease or endothelial dysfunction. In type 2, there is uh, acute coronary thrombosis in patients with pre existing coronary artery disease, and this occurs in my case. In type 3, occurs in a patient with uh, uh, previously diluting stent, and uh, this drug causes plate, uh, histamine activation release and uh, thrombus formation, and expiration of thrombus and staining uh, reveal a presence of eosinophil and mast cells. So diagnosis of coronary syndrome, uh, there is difficult in diagnosis as there is diverse clinical manifestation and uh, clinician should have a, a mind that uh, coronary syndrome may be present in all cases of allergic reaction. And this is the management, emergency management should be done in case of coronary syndrome and there is, uh, as, as early management, there is improved prognosis and there is simultaneous management of allergic reaction and coronary syndrome should be done. And in uh, the allergic, uh, we should remove the uh, patient from trigger. There is oxygen inhalation and IV fluid deep needed. And we should give antihistamine and IV steroid. For uh, acute coronary syndrome, we, we should give antiplatelets, statin, and there we uh, also give nitroglycerin and calcium channel blocker. We should avoid epinephrine and beta blocker as this uh, may um, more aggravate the vessel constriction and vessel spasm. And we should also avoid the we should also avoid morphine as they activate the Marcel and degradation of Marcel cause uh, which hamper which also aggravate the situation. So in conclusion, Kaunis syndrome is not uncommon but is a frequently uh, undiagnosed or undiagnosed. Early diagnosis is a paramount importance because of its high mortality due to cardiac arrest or sudden death. Emergency clinician should always consider Kaunis syndrome when dealing with a ca any kind of degree of allergic reaction. Management is challenging as there is no guideline. Avoid epinephrine, beta blocker or morphine during management as this may worsen the situation. Thank you for your patient sharing. Thank you Dr. Dev Devlal for your exceptional presentation with Kaunis syndrome. Now may I request our register of NICBD Dr. Al Amin to present his case. Uh, good afternoon, uh, respected uh, chairperson uh, and panelist. I am happy to see also Professor Abdullah Shafi Mojundar and Professor Abu Azam. And uh, one amazing thing I could learn that is Kuni syndrome. And uh, I think I am fortunate. I had several history of B vita, but I didn't have any history of MI. So today I am going to present uh, one simple case, I think. That is, uh, how precisely we can do angioplasty? Uh, my patient was uh, 44 years male. He was having uh, class 3 angina despite on optimum anti angina medications. He doesn't have any specific risk factor. Uh, his ECG and EQ was normal. So we went for diagnostic run. Uh, this is his left system. Uh, we can see his uh, circumflex is uh, rudimentary. And right coronary artery is dominant. And you can see his uh, LED is diffusely diseased from proximal to mid LED and maximal stenosis around 90% at mid LED. So uh, we tried to, uh, so we plan to place one stand in the LED. So we uh, cross the lesion with one floppy wire. Uh, one thing you can observe that uh, we were actually confused about in the proximal part where we will place the stand. So we have uh, pre-dilated the uh, lesion with a uh, 2.5 into 12 millimeter balloon at 12 atmosphere. So as we were, uh, as we were confused about where will you s s place the stent at the proximal LED, so we uh, went to the OCT run. And you can see this OCT, this has three marker. One is distal, one is mid, and uh, one is proximal. If you look closely and this o OCT catheter is moving, uh, and this is the picture of OCT, actually, why do we do OCT? Uh, through this OCT, we try to uh, find out the distal landing zone, proximal landing zone, as well as the characteristics of the lesions. And uh, 
this patient's, uh, you can see the OCT run, the OCT is moving. Uh, so far, you can see this lesion is, uh, is fatty, fibro fatty plaque, and there is the tiny calcification, uh, minimal calcifications. And there was a confusion uh, about us actually, where is the uh, lesion, how far extends in the proximal LED. Uh, but uh, you can see the, the proximal LED, that's the most proximal one, that this one is uh, disease free. So we could find out two landing zones, the distal landing zone and proximal landing zone. And this is how we have, uh, we have uh, measured the distal reference diameter. And it was uh, 2.7. So distal reference diameter was 2.7. And uh, proximal reference diameter was around 2.82. Uh, so uh, we have placed one stent that is, uh, and length was uh, according to OCT calculation, it was 35.5. So we have placed one stent that was 38 millimeter, that was a 2.75 diameter at the 16 atmosphere. Uh, we have inflated the stent balloon and uh, you can observe the TME3 integrate flow is achieved. And we have post dilated the lesion. And this is the basic. So uh, again, we uh, run OCT and we, we observe a few things, how far our stent is opposed, uh, how it was landed, and, and you can see we observe, we achieved 4.7 uh, millimeter square minimal stent area, that is quite good. And a position is uh, quite nice from distal to proximal one. And uh, then how can, we, uh, how can we identify the position is good that is, that is, the OCT has a particular color dimensions, and this color, when there is a red color, it, it indicates uh, the apposition is not good. But uh, the throughout the length, uh, the apposition was good. And this is how OCT looks. Uh, you can see the starts of the stems as well. See how closely, the how uh, beautiful the uh, OCT image is. So this is the final result. Uh, you can see the TME3 integrate flow. So my take home message is that technologies are evolving. Uh, we can use OCT, we can use IVAS. In this case, we, can, we could also use IVAS, but OCT, you can see OCT has a better uh, visualization. Uh, that's Two minutes that's Professor left. Professor M.G. Azam, uh, he is the uh, primary operator of this case. And uh, actually, uh, this is, a, uh, this is a, a day of another happiness for us, this particularly I am a people of South Bengal and this breeze uh, makes me very much happy and that's a day of our national achievement. Uh, thank you all for your passion sharing. Thank you very much. It was really a difficult case and you have managed it very meticulously with OCT and finished the case uh, brilliantly. Thank you, Dr. Alamin. Now, may I request Dr. Arifur Rahman Shajol to present his case, A Drowning Man Catches a Straw. Chairperson, learned audience, good evening. I am Dr. Mohammad Arifur Rahman. Welcome you all to this session. My title is A Drowning Man Catches to a Straw. So my patient, Mr. X, 58 years old, hypertensive diabetes smoker, presented at dead of night with the compressive chest pain and dizziness for two hours. On admission, his pulse was 56 beats per minute and blood pressure was 80 by 50 millimeter mercury. On admission, ECG showed is a very clear cut picture of acute ST elevation MI inferior with sinus bradycardia and also there is anterior lid T inversions. So uh, it's a very clear picture that the patient has got an inferior MI and we should go for a meticulous management. Immediately, or we give him the loading aspirin 300 milligram and ticagrel 180 milligram, followed by normal saline and atropine to stabilize the patient. After that, we go for counseling or the attendance for primary PCI, and we have a vision that uh, there should be some sort of uh, RCA occlusion, and it will be 10 to 15 minutes to open the vessel. Ultimately, patient party was agreed. In the meantime, we got call from the attending physician that the patient has not recordable BP and pulse, and he developed asystole. Immediately, the CPR started. Patient was intubated as saturation also fall, and he was put on ventilator. Ionotrope started along with normal cell and to raise the blood pressure. So it continued uh, at least 15 to 20 minutes, and then again we come to the patient attendance to describe the situation who is going on along with the 
uh, few data. In hospital, CPR for cardiac arrest was associated with 40 to 50 percent success rate, but only 22 percent alive at the discharge. And if it is more than 10 minutes CPR, then prognosis is worse. Hearing the information, patient attendance then denied about the primary PCI. So uh, what will be our next strategy? Then we discuss with the thrombolysis. Then we plan whether streptokinase or tenecticline plays. After explaining the, both the situations, and they agreed to go for the tenecticline plays, and we give the tenecticline plays immediately. And it's a very soothing ECG after the tenecticline plays that uh, you see patient is on sinus rhythm, and there's also uh, some sort of ST resolution. And we, can, we have a guess that there might be a very good recanalization of the vessel after tenecticline plays. And as, as the also a patient was, uh, hemodynamic stables on inotropes. Then uh, again, we plan for a pharmacological strategy to see what's going on inside. After appropriate preparation and counseling with the patient attendance, we took the patient in the cath lab. But uh, the, uh, when we give the angiogramic shot, we found there is a non, uh, the, LED, the L6 distal has got also a significant lesion, and LED was good. But RCA, uh, the culprit vessel, uh, after 10 hectic plays, the uh, picture was not that much satisfactory as because we have given 10 hectic plays and you see there is total occlusion at, uh, from the total distal part and also a significant lesion in the proximal part of the RCA. So uh, uh, the idea we got that patient has got a good recanalization after 10 plays was totally wrong concept in this case. So we plan uh, for revascularization. We took a 6 French catheter, run to floppy wire and a balloon uh, two to 15 minute track, and we inflate it at the 10 to 15 atmosphere. And we see the uh, vessel was totally occluded as maybe there was huge thrombus burden. Also, thrombus may be also dislodged, uh, occluding the distal segment of the RCA. So uh, we put a 2.75 millimeter into 38 everolumous stain, covering the distal segment, along with a 3 into 48 everolumous eluding stain, covering the progen signal. That there is a whole vessel was covered with stand. And uh, the result was a bit satisfactory. Even then, there was a so slow flow. So uh, we started uh, integralin and also continued the integralin for next 18 hours. Patient was on um, inotropes and extubated after one day and discharged after four days. So if we uh, analyze the course of the patient, the course of interventional procedure is totally unpredictable. Decision needed to be adjusted time to time or case to case base. Timely switching of the strategies may lead to a better outcome. Tenecti place may not guarantee recanalization, so pharmacognitive strategy is the reasonable option, and judicious use may end with a smiling outcome. Thank you. Thanks for patient hearing. Indeed, the man was drowning, and Dr. Arifur Rahman Shajol had saved that man and gave him a second life very brilliantly. This is the work that a cardiologist do and patients are grateful for that. Now we are moving to our next uh, case that will be presented by Dr. Atikur Rahman. Respected chairperson of the session, expert panelist, and learned participants, Assalamu alaikum and very good afternoon. I am Dr. Mahmoud Atikur Rahman, would like to present case entitling a silly matter may impact a lot. So this is my case. A for 59 years old male, a case of non STMI, who was planned for CAG plus minus revascular addition. And this is the short history. Patient was normotensive, diabetic, and smoker. All vitals were normal. ECG was normal, as well as the echo with LBF 60%. This is the audiocodal view showing normal left main with 90% lesion in the principal wave. Also, critical lesion in ramus intermedius. And epicranial view also showing the same. Arachnoidal view showing 50 to 60 percent lesion in proximal LED and 90 percent lesion in principal wave. And arachnoidal view, LED lesion seems to be a bit non-critical, with critical lesion in principal wave as well. So the aleocaudal view showing normal left main as well as proximal LCX and LED with critical lesion in ramus intermedius. On the right side. LEO and LEO cranial view showing RCA is ectatic with critical lesion in distal PLB. So this is essentially a TVD 
But what should be the reverse colorization strategy? We decided to stand the OM and keep the other lesion on optimum medical therapy. We took 3.5 curve EBU catheter, 5 French, and run through flow beware that was advanced up to the distal part of the target OM vessel. And pre balloon was done with 2 into 12 millimeter NCU fora. And uh, that was very smooth, smoothly done. Balloon it was in progress. And we took 2.5 into 22 millimeter days, but uh, the stent was, uh, we feel resistance in very initial step of the stent advancement. And we took Cine, whether there was any kinking in the catheter, but there was no kinking. We took the stent out and take a Cine, but the vessel was showing very smooth lumen. So we are in dilemma, what was the reason? Is that the wear or the catheter that prevent the advancement of the stent? And then we changed the wear, took another wear with a uh, strong shaft that was all-star floppy wear. But again, the stent was struck on the same area. Then what might be the reason? Then finally, we take the catheter out and take a cine and the vessel was also a patent. So what might be the reason and what to do? And this is the catheter that was pulled out and you can see there is a kinking, there is kinking here and kink there. And Photos from different angle will describe it. And for your kind information, it was a brand new catheter, but it was a kinked in its middle part. After changing the catheter, we proceed with the another stand because that stand was stuck in the lesion, and that was 2.5 into 26 millimeter and we succeeded to place the stent in the target area and deployed the stent and after we did the post balloon and as the time was very long the patient was become restless everybody was anxious and we took two post balloon one is 2.75 quantum apex 2.75 uh, 12 millimeter and another Wilma 3 into 10. As we are running short of time, so I will skip some slide. And this is the final picture, though the result was com not completely satisfactory, but I think it is acceptable. So I have a very short take home message. Every hardware should be checked well before introducing inside the patient's body, whether it's new or used. Thank you very much for your patience hearing. Thank you, Dr. Atikur Rahman, for your case. Now, may I request Dr. Anusul Awal for his case presentation, as he described it as failure is the pillar to success. I am going to show some cases done in Chittagong. My first case, Mr. SI, 50 years, male, diabetic, hypertensive, history of smoking. ECG shows anteroceptal MI, echo wall motion abnormality is present and history of anteroceptal MI two years back. CAG shows osteoproximal 90 to 95% lesion in allergy. So, uh, guide catheter JL4, guide wire run through F, and balloon, we use several balloons, two, uh, three, and four size balloon. And we use two stand, one uh, distally, 2.5 into 30, and another one is uh, 3.5 into 30. Because the lesion do have a significant disparity. So uh, this is the NGO of this patient. Right side have minimum plaque, and uh, 
in the left side, as you can see, there is osteoproximal lesion in the LAG, and also there is a distal lesion. And there is significant mismatch between the proximal and distal lesion. And patient is symptomatic, and then we plan to go ahead for PCI. So, we wear the uh, lesion in LAG, predilate, both uh, distal and proximal lesion. Yeah, it's, it's in a single loop. That's I, I can just modify right now. So it will it will come automatically. So uh, what happened? Uh, we, we took the uh, put a distal lesion 2.5 into 30, and overlapping the proximal lesion, we come across up to ostium of the left main. And the uh, proximal lesion uh, we covered by 3.5 into 38, and we overlap with the proximal stand, and we make sure that there is no, uh, uh, nothing is uncrossed, uh, uh, so that you do not miss the ostium, and not to miss the uh, overlapping also. And after doing that, we check in the stand view, and we found that there is some uh, undilated part, we post-dilate the lesion. After post-dilatation, as you can see, there are some uh, pinching of the LCX. So uh, we take another wear, we cross to the uh, proximal uh, start, and we cross the lesion, and then we take a small balloon, we uh, first we dilate the, and keep the start enlarged, then we make a kissing inflation, and make a final part. And as you can see, after making uh, the final part with the four size balloon, the uh, lesion uh, looks healthy. So there is another one. Yeah. This is another uh, case. Mr. Uh, AS57 male, ECG showing LBB. Actually, he had an ICM, ejection fraction 40%, but he has several episodes of unstable angina uh, and he was admitted with chest pain. That's why we went for angiogram. And while doing angiogram, we found this lesion. As you can see, there is an ugly dissection in the right coronary artery, which is spontaneous coronary artery dissection actually. And there is also spontaneous coronary artery dissection in the LAG and diagonal. As a patient is uh, having chest pain, ongoing and we found only the lesion in the distal LAG could be which can do something. So we put a small stand in the distal LAG. Two minutes left. Yeah. I, I come with the, my last case. This is the octogerian, inferior my patient, showing a right corner artery lesion distally. And as you can see, the lesion is very distal and it's a shepherd crew. And we try to overcome the lesion uh, through regular wire, pre-dilate. And while we try to pre-dilate the lesion, we found that uh, we cannot cross up to the whole lesion length. And we take a body wire to improve the support. But as you can see, the catheter whole thing is coming out while we try to put the uh, forward. Then we take the guidezilla. With the help of guidezilla, we are able to pre-dilate the lesion. We can take the uh, stand in the, in the right place and also we are able to post dilate the lesion. And we are able to finish the job nicely. So this is an example where support is matters and when the traditional matters fail, then we can use the help of Gaizilla, we can uh, tackle this type of lesion. So thank you very much for your kind hearing. I, I have shown some of the few cases there in Chittagong. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anisul Awal, for your brilliant presentation. Now, may I request Dr. Nure Khuda to present his case in primary PCI, all or one law, how we will approach. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, honorable chairperson, uh, respected panelist, and learned audience, uh, welcome you all. Very good afternoon uh, to my presentation. Uh, at the early morning, there was a lively discussion regarding primary PCI at Hall A, and, uh, and now, at late evening, the session is going to conclude it again with the primary PCI. And obviously, primary PCI is always rewarding 
and let's uh, have a look or let's go through a case firstly our case was a, a, a female patient 45 years diabetic hypertensive patient presented with a chest pain for 8 hours in an icbd and hemodynamically she was stable and ekg shows there is a clear cut STEMI anterior so the patient party was uh, counseled regarding primary PCI and uh, they agreed to do so. So the cath lab uh, was activated and we go through transradial route. Angio shows the right system there is a 70 to 80 percent stenosis at the proximal part and 50 to 60 percent stenosis at mid part. And the left system the mid LED from the mid LED it is 100 percent uh, occluded and the L6 also 100 percent occluded. So the mid LED 100 percent occluded from what should be done PCI to LED L6 and RCA uh, option B send the patient for CABG or option C PCI to LED then send the patient to CCU and stage, stage PCI to L6 and RCA. So let's go through some evidence approximately 50 percent of STEMI patients have additional or severe stenotic lesions in non infract related coronary arteries. So it's a big deal and let's go through some evidence. Civil pre trial was the first in 2015 published. They challenged the conception of conservative management of non infarct related artery at that time. And the result favored complete revascularization, significantly lowered the rate of composite primary endpoint at 12 months follow up. Subsequent Danami uh, 3 prime multi trial published. In 2015, also favors the complete revascularization and STEMI patient. Then deferred versus conventional stent implantation in STEMI patient, Danami 3 deferred trial. Uh, sometimes the uh, thrombus burden is an issue. So what should we do? Defer the patient uh, to stabilize the thrombus, then uh, again stress PCI. But this trial shows that there is no difference between the deferred and um, the no conventional PCI, uh, there is no uh, difference in uh, periprocedural complication. Next, compare equity uh, investigator uh, also sh showed in 2017 that FFR guided complete revascularization of non infarct related arteries in the acute setting resulted in a risk of composite cardiovascular outcome that was lower than the risk among those who were treated for infarct related artery only. So this trial also favored the complete reverse revascularization either staged or uh, during primary PCI. Okay. And another issue was uh, should we uh, do complete revascularization in shock uh, in patient comes with STEMI with shock. But the uh, groundbreaking trial that uh, culprit shock trial the investigator showed that it is uh, not wise to do the uh, total revascularization in shock patient and 2019 Two minutes left uh, the M multiple piece of mi in complete trial this is a big trial around 4000 patients were included in complete trial and it also favors complete revascularization in STEMI patient uh, usually is test superior to culprit lesion only pci and civil pit trial uh, long term uh, long term a reduction in death and MI with complete revascularization also favor complete revascularization. So compare acute uh, three years that is long term outcome that is also, also uh, uh, favors the complete revascularization in more is more beneficial in terms of outcome and healthcare cost at uh, 36 month follow up. So 2018 ESC guideline uh, there is class 2 indication of a uh, non era. Uh, that is complete revascularization of uh, prim uh, during primary PCI and 2021 SEC AHA guideline there is class 1 re uh, recommendation in selected hemodynamically stable patients with STMI and multivessel disease after successful primary PCI. Stage PCI of significant non-infract artery is recommended. 
So go back to our cases. Wire passes smoothly and uh, flow established in LED. Then we uh, two, 20 to 15 millimeter maverick balloon pre dilatation done. Strand placed across the lesion 2.7 into 20. Uh, 2.75 into 40 millimeter or zero taken and it was placed across the lesion and stand was deflated stand view taken and post dilation done with NC balloon to 3.25 into 8 millimeter and uh, similarly the stand is well uh, uh, well Accommodate and this is the final view TME 3 flow established. So the final view shows there is a TME 3 flow and LED. And unfortunately, patient was not agreed to do any further uh, uh, further procedure. So uh, they mm, took discharge. So my take home message is in hemodynamically stable patients with STME and Multiphasal disease after successful primary PCI, stage PCI of significant non infarct artery stenosis is recommended to reduce the risk of death or MI. And in selected hemodynamically stable patients with STME, PCI of non infarct artery stenosis may be considered at the time of primary PCI to reduce cardiac events. So, thank you all and pray for the flooded area, Silet and Shunamgans. And thank you all for patience here. Thank you, Dr. Nurekhuda. Thank you, all presenters. Now I'd like to request uh, Professor Dr. Abdullah Shafi Mojumdar sir to take and dice and take your seat. Professor Khalid Mohsin sir, please. Now I request Dr. Mohammad Shahriyar Kobir sir to give your valuable opinion. Thank you. Actually, all the speakers were brilliant in their presentation, but I like to, uh, like to mention particularly the first presenter. Uh, the topic is uh, probably very much essential for us who work in the periphery and who uh, like to do PCI in our centers with less supports. I think we should have a uh, covered stand in our hands. Uh, if the institution does not support, then we have to manage by ourselves. He nicely demonstrated how uh, to manage the perforation by covered stent, and in absence of covered stent, how to manage stepwise by proximal balloon inflation, and with the second stent, and prolonged inflation with the uh, stent balloon. Uh, thank you very much. Now I'd like to request uh, Professor Khalid Mohsin, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just uh, want to brief, uh, make some brief comments about uh, the cases. Actually, regarding the Bijoya's case, uh, with which they ended in perforation, I think that the bed preparation, pre-stenting pre was a bit inadequate because of this reason, there was very high post-dilatation pressure was required to oppose the stent, so that might have uh, caused the perforation because there was some calcification. I suspect there was some calcification and there was some, uh, that might have caused the, uh, some perforation. And without a covered stent, it, it was managed very nicely. And, but I didn't see any pericardial drain was given, but this was no. I am asking for that question, I am wanting for that question. Sir, actually for my first cases, uh, there was mild pericardial effusion in the uh, OT table and we followed up this patient and, and as we uh, manage the patient at the cath lab and we sequentially follow up the patient in the, uh, for two days and, and the pericardial uh, uh, effusion was not increased in amount. So we did not do any amount of transfusion or it was not. And for the next cases, uh, and unfortunately or unfortunately, this patient did not even uh, develop any pericardial effusion. And we instantaneously uh, placed the uh, long stand there. Yes, for the juniors, I think the pericardial drain can be life-saving in case of perforation. So we need to follow up the patient by periodic echocardiogram. 
So uh, it is uh, uh, sometimes, uh, most of the cases we require a pericardial vein. And regarding Jaffrin's case, uh, it was a, a, actually the, what we, she did it with the tap very, in a very nice way. But in case of tap, it is better to do the angulated vessel first. Tend the angulated vessel first because the LCX was at a 90 degree angle. So I think it would have been, sometimes it is very difficult if we make the LED stand first. It's to track a stand 90 degree, it is sometimes difficult. And most of the operators will prefer to do the LCX first because it's the more angulated vessel and then stand the LED. But uh, uh, she did it very nicely. Uh, and regarding the Debdulal's case, the bee sting, uh, the, uh, it is obviously there is a county syndrome. I think Nuralam is here. Uh, he uh, managed uh, the patient very nicely. And regarding Shajal's case, uh, there was a failed thrombolysis with tenecteplase. What, what brand of tenecteplase Shajal used? Was it the original one or a, or a generic one? Uh, uh, though it's a very, uh, 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 it is an operator's discretion which brand to use. Huh? Yes, the generic ones are sometimes less effective than the original brands. So I, we, I would request you to do a study between the generic one and the uh, original one the, regarding the efficacy, angiographic efficacy. But uh, you managed it very nicely. And regarding uh, Awal's case, Anisul Awal, uh, you did a left main to LED stenting in a sizable circumflex, but you didn't wear the circumflex at all. Uh, so uh, I think it is better to put two wears, it will make the guide stable. And as you are attempting a proximal LED lesion, sometimes the, the guide sucks in and causes left main dissection. So it is better to do the, put the wear in two vessels. So it will give you a much better comfort zone uh, and it is also diff easier to, uh, uh, to locate the stent, the proximal edge of the stent if you have two wears. And regarding an ICM case, uh, you did the coronary angiography. Did you do a viability testing in a patient with a ICM before you did attempted a coronary angiogram? Patient though ICM, he had several time admission with unstable angina, with chest pain. Uh, that's why we consider that this patient is having chest pain, recurrent chest pain. That's why we go ahead with the angiogram and try to do something. No, in, in a case of ICM, I think it is, it is very important to see uh, whether we are, uh, uh, there is enough uh, viable myocardium before we subject a patient to coronary revascularization. It is, it is almost mandatory nowadays and it is a, can be done by uh, cardiac MRI and also by, I think, uh, the nuclear studies. So in a patient with ICM, I think it is uh, not uh, guideline-directed therapy to increase the flow to a scar tissue. It will not help the, it's going to help the patient too much. So I, 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 I would expect uh, Majumdar sir's uh, uh, opinion. Whenever, whenever there is an infarct-related artery and the LV function is decreased, then one has to assess the viability of the myocardium of the area that is supplied by that coronary artery. I think earlier we have done that. Now we have done infarct-related artery. But nowadays, when we have the viability concept has been developed. And there are opportunities to have the viability test. Even by the echocardiography, you can assess the viability. So, it is mandatory before you do the PCI to the infarct related artery. Until unless it is primary PCI. Primary PCI is okay. But in the days after, weeks after the infarction, and it is related with the ICM, one has to do the uh, MPI and the PET, PET scan to assess the area of the viable tissues. Tale amra puste parbo kun jodi multivessel disease hoy, which artery should be uh, uh, targeted? Ita amader dekhte hobe, thay na? Yes. Am I right? Yes, sir. Uh, actually, we need to identify the hibernating myocardium. 
that is the main thing. If the revascularization has to be successful either percutaneous or surgical, there should be some hibernating myocardium. And it can be detected, uh, it should be detected before we attempt uh, to uh, do coronary angiogram of the patient. So I think there the tools are here with us and we need to use them judiciously. And uh, regarding Nure Khoda's case, actually this is, was very, the infarct related artery was very straightforward, the LED. So you need to do the LED first and do the stage PCA to the other two vessels. So there is a very, uh, uh, not a very difficult decision in the cath lab. So uh, all the uh, presenters presented very nicely uh, and uh, I think uh, they did a good job. Thank you. Now I request our Honorable Shafi Mujumdar sir to uh, conclude the session. I cannot elaborate the speaker's presentation, but I know that the, it is very encouraging that eight interesting cases have been presented in these sessions by the, some experienced, some novice, but the younger people. It is very much encouraging to us that the young people, not only they are uh, performing the good cases, but also they are interested to present the cases before the audience. This is very much encouraging. I. Uh, congratulate the uh, scientific secretaries or the office secretary of the BSCI for organizing this sort of sessions uh, so that uh, we have learned also we, they are in encouraged, the younger are encouraged. Thank you very much and I conclude this session here. Thank you sir. Now the craze giving ceremony to the presenters. May I request Professor Shafi Mojumda sir to hand over the craze to Dr. Bijay Dotto. Now requesting Professor Khaled Mohsin sir for hand over the crest to Dr. Jafrin Jahan. May I request Dr. Shohidul Haq sir to give away crest to Dr. Dev Dulal. May I request Professor Shafi Mojumda sir to hand over the crest to Dr. Alamin. May I request Professor Khaled Mohsin sir to hand over the crest to Dr. Arifur Rahman Shajol. May I request Dr. Humayun Kobir Mintu sir to give away crest to Dr. Atikur Rahman. May I request Dr. M.D. Shariat Kobir sir to give away crest to Dr. Anisul Awal. May I request Dr. Khaled Mohsin sir to give away crest to Dr. Nure Khuda. Thank you honorable chairpersons, panelists and the presenters of this session. May I request uh, Professor Shafi Mozumdar sir to give away crest to Dr. Nur Alam.